Welcome to the show, dude. Thanks, Luke. Great to be here. Here we are <laughs> once again. So Julian Mitchell, our guest today, this is our second time hanging out. You came over uh, once before and we just did a full chill session and download mm-hmm. and I realized, hmm, this guy knows a lot about a lot of things. I need to get him on the show, so I'm glad you're able to make it here today. Awesome, thanks. I'm always excited to talk mushrooms. Yeah, and I'm always excited to talk to someone with a different accent, too. <laughs> Obviously, you're from Kentucky, I'm getting? Or? Just south of Kentucky, Australia. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool, man. So um, let's just jump right in and talk about how you got your start um, in the business of medicinal mushrooms, which, of course, is going to blossom into a much more widespread project, as I understand it. But you're like three years in the game here and in, in the business end of it. Yeah, yeah. So what first piqued your interest to start to go into the world of fungi? Mm, it was really looking, I guess, at uh, the future of food as a first point of call and and how we're feeding ourselves and how we're going to feed populations in the future and understanding the the GMOs and the, the pesticides and all of these things and where can we go for a clean source of food uh, and incorporating a sustainable aspect to it in terms of deforestation, chemical use, land use, water use, how can we create something economical for the planet in terms of sustainable. And so mushrooms just ticked all the boxes from an early point of view. We sort of looked at it and saw it as an uncharted continent in terms of growing mushrooms for a food supply. Um, for a wide range of people in you know across different continents across different environments because they can grow both indoor and outdoor but they're very adaptable to the environment and so that was our first point of call of, of saying well hey no one's really doing that in where we're from in WA Perth at the time Ryan and myself uh, four and a half years ago and then from there really again it was an uncharted continent of mushrooms with just a wonderland of opportunity um, beyond just putting them on someone's plate putting them into restaurants and so that was sort of our initial idea was was that when you guys started out did how long did it take you to monetize selling culinary mushrooms to local restaurants and whatnot and are there any in Australia did you have to deal with any regulatory agencies in terms of food sanitation origins of food things like that to make it commercially available yeah it was um growing our first mushroom was was almost like having our first kid which we haven't experience before but um you know ryan i both don't have any children but in terms of uh that piece around uh growing mushrooms like you mentioned earlier you know when you had some plugs and you tried to grow some mushrooms (laughs) off a log which you know it's not as easy as sort of putting some tomato seeds no Um, i think any any kid that's like tried to grow um like when I was a kid, I used to always try to grow weed, you know, and I would end up with male plants or they would get stolen or deer would eat them. It was very difficult. And I've known many of people that are like, oh, I want to trip out on psychedelic mushrooms and they try to grow those. And it's yeah. not as easy as one might think. Very complicated. And a lot of the times we very early, we were growing off of coffee ground. And it's a key part of sort of that circular economy piece of this nutrient source that is you know farmed and shipped over for only one percent to end up in the cup and the rest to end up as ground that goes to landfill it's a valuable nutrient resource that can be repurposed and that's what we grow some mushrooms from as well and so yeah doing that was a nice idea but very difficult from a scientific point of view early on and so uh, we had a, a key team member chief scientist Thomas from france joined the team who's a biotechnology engineer to help us on that cultivation journey um, because the science was was very difficult <laughs> that's funny about the uh, I, i've heard you talk about growing your mushrooms on the medium of coffee grounds and i think that's really cool for a couple of different reasons a is because obviously that's just a, a wasted resource all the energy that goes into growing coffee and i think about that when i throw my grounds down the garbage disposal i'm like there's some use of this and so years ago i heard somewhere that they were a rich source of nitrogen you know coffee grounds and that you could put them in soil and things like that as sort of a fertilizer Mm -hmm. and so i started like putting them in my house plants and then all my house plants grew mold (laughs) so it's like yeah they must be a great medium to grow fungi because that's exactly what happened to me but not the spores that i wanted to so how far did you guys go with growing mushrooms and selling them to you know the farmers market and restaurants and things like that? Like, yeah, we went. Uh, we were s- s- growing hundreds of kilos at a time. Really? Um, it p- per week because they go super quick. After fourteen days, you've got a crop. Um, so nothing really grows as quick as mushrooms in terms of the value, nutrient value that they have. Um, and so we were doing that to restaurants all around our city. And then I guess we just sort of again saw that understanding of what was unfolding in terms of 
mushrooms, their capabilities from a medicinal point of view. The interest at the time was really around CBD, and CBD was early in the space four and a half years ago, and understanding and people want that natural ailment or that natural solution um, in their everyday life as a preventative measure as well. And so looking at these medicinal mushrooms, because we were at that time just growing oyster mushrooms, some lion's mane and some others, from a culinary point of view, but looking at those mushrooms themselves are very powerful from a medicinal point of view, but looking at the others, such as reishi, cordyceps, turkey tail. Yeah. Are lion's mane mushrooms, also, they're also a culinary mushroom? They are. They're known as lobster of the woods. Oh, um, really? They taste like lobster in your mouth, quite uh, different and quite delicious. That's funny. You know, I was, when I was thinking about... Um, prepping this episode and knowing that you you did have some background in the culinary side of mushrooms and i've never liked eating mushrooms Mm. i mean i've eaten a lot of psychedelic mushrooms and i love medicinal mushrooms which we're going to of course talk about but culinary mushrooms that you get you know that come in your pasta or on a pizza or something like that i've just always hated the flavor and the texture but in preparation for this interview it just happened (laughs) to be fateful that this took place but i was at a uh, a private dinner last night at a place here called Cafe Gratitude in their yeah. um, Beverly Hills restaurant, and they had a, a kind of a opening celebration type thing, and they had the members of this um, kind of 60s, 70s cult called uh, Source Family, mm-hmm. and the members were there, so I really wanted to go for that. If anyone hasn't seen the documentary about the Source Family, like do yourself a favor and watch it it's fascinating but so some of the ogs from the source family were there and then everyone wore white and it was this really great event and then one of the dishes was you know it's all vegan food which i typically have a hard time getting full from or digesting in many cases Mm -hmm. but they do that type of food well it was delicious and so um then one of the main two courses was like all mushrooms. And I just thought, maybe I just have this idea that I don't like mushrooms. And I've just held on to that idea since I was 10 because I got sick off a of mushroom pizza, I think, at one point. Mm. And uh, I used to think I was allergic to them because of that. Then I realized, no, I just don't like the taste. So last night I gave it like a completely open-minded, fair trial on some, what were probably, I don't know what variety they were, but probably some high quality um you know, culinary mushrooms, took a few bites and I'm like, no, I still hate mushrooms. <laughs> you know, I just can't do it. Uh, it's just weird. But so many, I, I don't know very many people that don't like eating It's a mushrooms. hate or love relationship with those. It is. Those, so I'm not, yeah. you know, no, you're, I just, you're not alone. That's anytime fine. I tell someone yeah. that, they're like, what? Mushrooms yeah. are delicious. How could yeah. you not like them? But yeah. mushrooms and also eggs. Like I eat yeah. egg yolks in my smoothies because I just mask the flavor and I like the, you know, the medicine that's in eggs yeah. but um yeah eggs and mushrooms are just two foods i've never been able to get past yeah. but anyway enough about me um <laughs> when it comes to culinary mushrooms what are the most nutritious of those varieties like i have a feeling when i walk in the grocery store and see those little common button mushrooms maybe those aren't so great mm. but perhaps some of the more obscure or rarefied yeah. varietals might be more um, nutritionally there's, there's, dense there's over 300 strains that are edible um, that we know of that are you know open to the, to different markets, but the button mushroom or the champignon, maybe it's called over here, is um, you know the very standard mushroom that we all know of. It's almost the mushroom of economics in terms of its shelf life is stable. It's much easier to grow, but the medicinal benefits are lower. Still good benefits, um, but nothing compared to you know if you're eating lion's mane, if you're eating shiitake mushroom, if you're eating the oyster mushroom, which is sort of the, one of the specialty mushrooms that we were growing mostly was the oyster mushroom the king oyster pink oyster um, has great compounds such as ergothionine um, vitamin d vitamin k b vitamins and so if you're putting mushrooms in your diet you're on the right track absolutely Um, and if you don't have a hate relationship for them that's a bonus but that's also i guess why we went down the path of the extracts as well because a lot of people maybe don't consume them one as much um, and don't have access to those gourmet mushrooms and you've got to eat a lot more of them to get those compounds right so Mm. did you guys find at one point um that scalability was challenging just as a business like okay there's a few of us and we were able to grow tons of these mushrooms and sell them locally but i imagine due to shelf stability etc it's probably difficult to be shipping culinary mushrooms around exactly it was sort of uh both in terms of an excitement point of view um what we wanted to be investigating from a biotechnology point of view. I guess we started off as farmers in a true sense, and now we're a biotechnology company, and we made that shift very early. 
by bringing on the science, by bringing on you know, biotechnology engineer and other scientists in that space, microbiologists, um, working with nanotechnologists and working with mycologists. And so names that we never knew when we got into the business. Right, right. Uh, but going along that learning journey, um, understood again that you know, those biotechnology applications were something we're very passionate about for solving real world problems. Uh, but starting with you know human extracts as well was very something we're very passionate about because we're able to opt- optimize and you know hopefully unlock people's true potential in the sense of you know helping them overcome any issues they may have with their own bodies with their own microbiome within their own uh, brain within their own you know cardiovascular system as a as a step one but beyond that then we've got the other things that we can touch on as well you know the decontamination of soils and many other applications so. Yeah, there's a lot there. <laughs> when you got, yeah, we're definitely going to get into all of that. Um, I have somewhat of a loose plan of how this is going to go, but I'm now I'm sort of becoming curious more about the process of growing mushrooms. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a buddy in Colorado who will remain unnamed, I guess, because <laughs> technically he's breaking a few laws, but he's growing uh, psychedelic mushroom, penis envy mushrooms is the variety. Okay. Specific, uh, they have a scientific name, but that's what everyone calls them for obvious reasons. If you saw one, you'd know why. Uh, but really potent psychedelic mushrooms, and he's he's doing his thing, and he showed me his operation, and it's very complex. It's mm. it's sort of like, it looks like what you would keep an iguana in. You know, there's like a <laughs> fish tank, but there's temperature controlled, and you have to keep germs out. So there's air filters and all sorts of little meters for the humidity and the temperature, and it looked to be quite complex. So is this, you know, if someone was like, hey, I want to, not for psychedelic mushrooms per se, but... I want to grow a medicinal mushroom, like my failed reishi mushroom mm. growth attempt that I alluded to earlier, and um, people that might want to grow some shiitake mushrooms or oyster mushrooms. Like, is it really difficult for a novice without a lot of scientific prowess to successfully grow mushrooms without them becoming contaminated or suspect to mold or whatever can mm. go wrong? Mm, very good question. Yeah, it's. It's very complicated and very simple in many ways once you understand the <laughs> the equation and the algorithms of humidity control, oxygen control, CO2 control, moisture content, quality of the substrate that you're using. And so all of those things are very important. Um, and I guess going into it early, <clears throat> excuse me, um, it was very difficult for us learning that process. But as we went down that path, as I said, bringing on science to the table, and once you're wanting to scale up, that's when it gets difficult. If you want to grow a couple of kilos of mushrooms, that's reasonably okay. You know, it's not too difficult if you dedicate 20, 30, 40 hours to learning. But beyond that, if you want to scale it, yeah, then you need to, I guess, go deeply into the science and to the equipment you're using to grow those fresh mushrooms. When you're a novice grower and things go wrong, what does that look like? Nothing happens, which is what happened to me when I tried to go reishi mushrooms. Just I'd go out and check every day. I'm like, nope, nothing happening. And then I just gave up and the log just sat there and maybe grew mushrooms eventually on its own from rotting in my backyard. Um, so does just nothing happen or do they? does the crop sort of become... Uh, contaminated or corrupt in some way where now there's you know other mold or weird stuff growing that you don't want in there like what happens when it doesn't work right exactly it's almost like a race you're setting the mushroom spawn up to overtake the substrate um, but it's really a fight between the fungi and the bacteria and that's been a fight since millennia between fungi and millennia and so uh, those two are battle you know go against each other for so such a long period of time that's why what we can go into is that the mushrooms are amazing uh against fighting bacterial infections and in fight and so a lot of them are antibacterial that's why a lot of them <clears throat> play an impo- important role in you know a- antibiotic replacement so antimicrobial resistance and so mushrooms when you're growing them really the fight is between giving them the best opportunity to take over that substrate to grow mushrooms versus the bacteria winning that fight. And so what you probably saw in your case or what people see very often is that the bacteria wins uh, and overtakes the fungi in the early days. And so you see trichoderma, which is this green mold on the mushrooms. And so a very key part um, is keeping a hygienic environment and making sure you do everything right to help the mushrooms uh, win that battle. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I guess right now I'm just I'm so fascinated by this kingdom which Mm. i always have been in the periphery and i've been using medicinal mushrooms of all different types for a long long time but after seeing this uh recent film which i encourage people to go out and see i'm sure by the time this 
particular conversation airs, it'll be mm-hmm. more widely available. But um, it pre-screened in a few cities, and you s- indicated that you had seen it as well. Fantastic fungi, yeah. Paul Stamets and Michael Pollan and all these great people in there. And there, I mean, that it was not only like just an interesting subject, but I thought the film was so well done. It was really it was brilliant, yeah. right? I yeah. mean, it was just like the yeah. graphics and yeah. just the production value was so high. And the story that it told and the narrative that was sort of weaved throughout mm-hmm. um, with all the different applications from environmental to medicinal mushrooms to the yeah. psychedelic um, part of it. And it was just so fascinating. And I just got it was sort of perfect timing to set up this <laughs> this conversation because I got like so kind of reinvigorated about it and just thought, God, these these this kingdom of whatever uh, is just so bizarre. And it's it's not a plant. It's not an animal the fungi kingdom is its own world and it's almost otherworldly and when you talk about the kind of ever long battle you know going back through origin of creation between bacteria and fungi and how there's always this balance and Mm -hmm. this battle for um, life it's just it's so interesting that now we're at a point technologically where we can create environments and harness the power of these mushrooms and then start to begin to use them for all different things, which is what we're going to, of course, go into. So it's Mm. super exciting stuff. I just find these little creatures are just so weird. I mean, it's it's trippy. It's going to be a very big topic over the next 10 years, really, in terms of all those applications in the movie that were spoken about. Um, you know, it's a, it's a kingdom that's been sort of uncharted for a long time. So we've got a lot of problems that we need to solve quickly. <laughs> I think, yeah, and also framing it as its own kingdom is important too um, from the perspective that I I see mushrooms sort of categorized as um, like people that eat plant-based include mushrooms. And I'm like, mm-hmm. well, that's not a plant though, <laughs> you know? It's its own thing. It's yeah. not just another vegetable or another fruit. It's kind of like the term you hear a lot, like, oh, you got to eat your fruits and vegetables mm-hmm. as if they're the same thing when yeah. in fact they're they're so different, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think this other kingdom is um, just a really fascinating thing to explore. The mushrooms are the conduit between the paleos and the vegans and the vegetarians because everyone can agree on them. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, because it's not a plant or an animal, <laughs> and it's good for everyone. Um, when you when you guys started growing on coffee grounds, what mm. was the uh, what was the motivation there versus using rice or some of the mm. other sawdust, some of the yeah. other things that people use as a growing medium? Yeah, it was really just around the city we were in has a lot of cafes, has a very big cafe culture. I mean, the whole world has a pretty big coffee culture. And so we understood this was an underutilized resource and just looking at circular economics and how do we close the loop on, uh, I guess, waste that's not necessarily waste and has another purpose in life, and that was the coffee ground. And so that was something that we looked into, had read about mushrooms being very good recyclers, dissemblers, very good in their DNA at adapting to nutrients and what they use as nutrients and so typically yes saw saw sawdust is used or other straw or other you know pallets or rice are used but coffee ground is another great substitute husks um, from the hemp industry can be used so they're very intelligent they adapt very quickly to what they can then digest and then they can turn that into you know something that they can then grow and thrive and create medicinal compounds from and so because we were at a place where coffee ground was was in abundance um, we trialed that and we use that and that is one of the key elements of what we grow with. Is there any issue with uh, pesticide residue or toxicity in coffee grounds? If the if the mycelium and then the fruiting body of a mushroom is coming from just thin air, water and coffee and mm-hmm. coffee beans being uh, worldwide one of the most pesticide laden mm-hmm things that we ingest is there any possibility of contamination from those pesticides being you know becoming uh, part of the mushrooms life mm, we're very specific on where we collect the coffee ground from which is important but then of course always you know doing our validity testing in terms of mycotoxin testing pesticide testing and to see you know if anything's coming through to the mushroom itself or to the mycelium which it's which is not which is quite remarkable um, so that was very important just to be able to show that so that's how you fix it you just test the end result the end product and make sure that nothing came through and work on sourcing to make sure you're not i'm just imagining like Mm. 
shite coffee like you know the Folgers and the tin can you give the grocery store like god knows where that coffee even we weren't going to starbucks but starbucks doesn't really right. exist in australia so it's sort of we're a bit coffee snobs in uh, in australia so oh you are it's uh very much high quality only uh, according to the baristas in australia we are very proud of our coffee are there uh, and this is kind of off topic but just delving into the coffee thing are there strict regulations in australia in terms of testing coffee from mycotoxins and pesticides etc like there are in europe versus the united states where we get pretty much the shit coffee that's left over that the other countries with more strict regulations won't allow to be imported yeah we're a lot closer to europe in terms of the testing and and the due diligence that goes into it and it's just such a competitive market and i think wherever there's a uh, competition then you know, com- companies want to lead, and so how do they lead? They lead by transparency and trust with their consumer and their customer. And so I guess touching on not just coffee but other substrates and taking a tangent is, you know, I think testing needs to occur across all foods, you know, in terms of you know what's been sprayed, what hasn't been, and I think that's another area that going forward over the next five years consumers are going to want for every food product. I know for myself I will. Um, you know, what's been sprayed with glyphosate, what hasn't? Um, what are we consuming on that lettuce, on those peanuts, on those almonds, on those macadamias, on those eggplants. So I think that those kind of foods all need to have that transparency. That's a really good point. Anyone listening in the food space, (laughs) economically speaking, I think Mm -hmm. that is because of podcasts like this and the proliferation of information that used to be sort of hidden, right? Yeah. Uh, Now we're becoming more aware of that. And you see this in the supplement industry. I'll even be vetting something that I find on Amazon. I'm like, oh, I need a K2 supplement or this or that. So I start looking for the best of the best, which is something I enjoy doing because then I can get the best stuff for myself and then share it with my audience and in my online store and whatnot. But now I'm seeing it used to be very difficult. I would have to call or email a company being like, hey, do you test for mycotoxins, heavy metals, yeast, mold, et cetera? Where's this stuff coming from? And I'd have to reach out to those companies. And now I'm finding on websites of supplement brands and even on their Amazon kind of info um, copy, it will indicate like all of the testing for all of those things, which is interesting, which is indicative of the public demand and the public general awareness that just because something says it's a supplement or vitamin or an herb that's good for me, there could be a relatively high risk of contamination considering the origins and the sort of um, supply chain of where that came from. So I think you're right as that moves into food. And imagine when you go into the bulk, like I'm thinking of the bulk bins at the health food store when I was a kid in the seventies, you know, there'd be like granola and oats and rice and all these different nuts. It's like, those are all silo, especially grains or mm-hmm. silo foods, you yeah, know, and they're, yeah. they're storable, yeah. have a long shelf life, which means they're much more susceptible to exposure to yeast, mold, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, with our products in the, in the new year, we will be bringing out pretty much a QR code, which will then be attached to the batch number and attached to the mycotoxin testing, pesticide testing, amino acids, beta-glucans, all of the important compounds within the mushroom. So again, just be transparent with that. So you can click on the bottle and you can see the QR code and then you can go straight to the lab testing for Oh, that. no way. Yeah. From that batch? Yeah. Damn, yeah. son, that's taking it to another level. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Because even with something you get off Am- Amazon, right, I mean, you still don't know. <laughs> you know, yeah. 100%, they can say tested for this, that, and show you their lab results. But then again, you know, are the regulatory agencies really yeah. on top of them in terms of what batch was tested? Like yeah. maybe they've had a batch tested yeah. and had clean labs come back from that, but not necessarily every batch and certainly not to the degree of traceability that you're describing. Yeah, and you've seen that in the CBD industry, I guess, in terms of efficacy, uh, in terms of, you know, a lot of people saying, oh, CBDs don't really work for me, or they do, or they don't, or there's a lot of inconsistency there, and there's a lot of inconsistency in quality of product, and I think you're going to see that in mushrooms as well as it becomes an attractive area. You're going to see you know, hundreds of, of companies in that powder space as well, and so I guess you've got to ask yourself those questions around where will the mushrooms grow and how would they grow and... Um, you know, are there heavy metal testing? Is there pesticide testing, mycotoxin testing available to see? Um, and then what are this, the actual const- constitutes within the mushroom in terms of beta glucans and other things, which is very early in the science for for what those compounds actually do. We have a nanotechnologist who works with us who's doing his PhD at the moment on beta glucans, and really we're still trying to understand and identify uh, what each one does and 
And so it's very early in the science, but I think just going back to those very simple questions, where were my mushrooms growing? How were they growing? Uh, what environment were they growing in? Because mushrooms are batteries. They're absorbers of their environment more than anything. And so they absorb the soil, they absorb the water, they absorb the air that they're growing in. And so um, you know, that's, we grow our mushrooms in Byron Bay, which is, I'm not sure if you've been there, but it's almost like a, it's very pristine. It's almost like a, a Hawaii, um, but uh, in a, an Australian sort of way. And so it's very untouched in in many ways and has an amazing environment to grow food. And uh, you guys, and for those of you watching on the YouTube video, which if I got I got our new camera set up here, um, you can see the products I'm talking about. Because when someone comes on the show and they have a book or a product, I decided I'm going to be like our TV show and have it like <laughs> sitting right here. Um, but your extracts that we're going to you know, get into the different ones and all the different medicinal mushrooms and what they can do for you and stuff. Um, you guys chose to do a liquid a dual extraction process, mm. which we'll talk about. What are, you know, if you just randomly go on Amazon and you're like, oh, reishi mushroom is good for you. I'm just going to order some random powder or something like that. Or most of these coming from China, as I understand them. And uh, because mushrooms are the absorbers of their environment, which is one of the great things about them, if their mm -hmm. environment is awesome, they're taking in that information from nature. But if it's, you know, if they're being grown outside of Beijing, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. like yeah. under heavy pollution, is, is, is that an issue in general in the industry? And is that why you guys decided rather than just importing bulk mushrooms and repackaging them, we're just going to like have control of the entire process? Exactly, and I was sort of, again, learning from that CBD space as well um, that was unfolding at the same time and understanding the consumer and me being a consumer and you being a consumer, what do you want? Uh, and so it's, I guess, yeah, 95% of mushrooms at least uh, on the market will be coming from China and I, I visited China four years ago on a young entrepreneurship trip and so I sort of saw that environment, amazing things that they're doing in AI and technology and, and these areas, but when it sort of comes to food as an Australian, we know you know, you don't, you don't buy avocados or oranges um, or any other food product necessarily from China, it's more so the other way around, where middle class China, who can afford it, import everything that they can from a food point of view. And so there is some question marks over that um, in, in many ways. And I guess beyond that, just being able to show transparency and just understanding that if you understand the science of mushrooms, there's so much innovation to occur there with the product. And so here we do it down that path of vertically integrating our business, which means you know we're, we're doing everything from lab culture, from harvesting the mushroom strain uh, you know, in different parts of Australia or sometimes over in Canada or sometimes in North America, having that culture and then growing it out into a mushroom and then... Uh, you know, farming that mushroom and then also beyond that turning it into an extract so we do the whole vertical chain and that I guess allows us to have quality assurance of the product and hopefully allows us also we believe to make the best quality product because we're constantly innovating we've got a team of scientists that are wanting to, to do good on that front and you know it's been great having people like Dave Asprey um, I guess you know support that process because when we first sort of sent some stuff to him he was sort of like had tried the powders had them in the bulletproof cafes, mm, nothing really noticeable for him. And as a biohacker, he's, I guess, very in tune with what he's feeling and what he's not. And so he sort of said, oh, you know, gave up a little bit on medicinal mushrooms. But then, um, you know, he was, first thing he really noticed was his REM sleep improve and his dreaming improve from the lion's mane that we have. And so, um, yeah, I guess when we first bring out these extracts, even for myself, I was like, I'm not sure if we can sell them because it was a very noticeable difference um, that you were getting from them. And so... It, Again, that quality assurance process is understanding where the mushrooms came from, how are they growing, and I think going forward, uh, the more you can tell that story as a business, um, the more trust you can build within your community, and of course, you can make a higher product in terms of efficacy, and that's what people want when they're buying these products. Do they feel something or do they not? Is there any uh, issue with the, how do I say this, like the genetics of a strain? So would say um a lion's mane or a reishi strain genetically be diluted if you're not getting like the spores from a source where the strain has proven to have the medicine in it to the degree mm -hmm. that you want and i'm thinking about cannabis here right so there's so many different strains of can cannabis and all these hybrids and when you want to grow a cannabis plant like it's all in that seed right what is yeah. in essence the seed of a medicinal mushroom and how much of a role does that play in its 
ability to actually have health benefits. Exactly, and that's really where it starts. It starts at that, at that, uh, on that petri dish, and how you're growing that mycelium and that hyphae, the little white threads, the base of the mushroom, how that's growing out. But we have a team member who's pretty much in charge of strain management. So oh, making sure weekly that they're healthy, making sure that they're constantly being renewed and so they're not weakening and so they're very potent. And so again, that sort of becomes its own sort of role and key part of the whole process. So why is that end product so good? Well, it's all the way along that supply chain was strain management is one task of, of 30 that uh, you know needs to be, I guess, done to ensure that you know product is, is high quality and that you're getting those benefits. So when it comes to agriculture, something that I think a lot of people are unaware of, and I, I wasn't for a long time, in the development of our agricultural system and our ability to grow plants, vegetables, to eat, hmm. right? We were talking about this earlier before we recorded, just the the food supply chain has become so diluted and hybridized, right? And humans have... <laughs> like the dumbasses that we are, we've bred out the medicine of mm. most of the, the vegetation that we eat. So there's that's why there's such a, um, a difference between like, if you go to the store and get some dandelion greens, which are not really hybridized, but close to the wild mm. dandelion greens you get out, you know, just collecting in nature seasonally. If you chew on some dandelion greens, that shit is bitter. It's not <laughs> really palatable. Yeah. But if you get some iceberg lettuce... You know, it's just basically water. So that mm -hmm. means all of the bitters and the medicines have been bred out of that. So as we've hybridized, we've actually lost a lot of the heirloom or heritage seeds yeah. that would have been unadulterated, you know, pre-12, 15,000 years ago or whatever, right? As plants were found in the wild. And then we bred plants together to make them uh, more manageable and more palatable. But we've systematically kind of removed the medicine from plants. Yeah. Not to mention, you know, the soil, which is where the plants are getting the nutrients from. So I think that's really interesting when it comes to the cultivation of mushrooms, especially mushrooms whose intent is to be medicinal, like the ones right here, that that must be a really important part of it, that you're making sure that it doesn't get adulterated along the supply chain so we end up with sawdust or just colored water in an extract. Right? Exactly, exactly. And it's... um. It's a fine, being a biotechnology company, you know, biotechnology companies can go in two directions. They can ad adulterate things too much, um, you know, chemical companies or pharmaceutical companies that I guess, you know, very focused on one compound, whereas our sort of belief is keeping it as whole body or as whole fruit and it crossed the life cycle of the entire plant and encompassing all of that. So it's a full spectrum product and putting it in extract because it's bioavailable. And so it's, it's working with technology and then it's working with biology and I guess trying to harmonize that relationship um, you know, and keeping things, you know, I guess as natural as possible is the key because we always overstep the mark sometimes as humans and think that we know better and think that we can, uh, you know, outsmart um, with some new gadget uh, this biological system that we have. <laughs> Welcome to my life every day uh, on my own biology. But uh, going back to the the extraction methods and the mm. end product of a of a supplement like a medicinal mushroom product we're you guys are now doing a, a dual extract so you're using water and then you're using alcohol to get that medicine out of the fungi is that correct yeah exactly so you're doing a, a water and a fat soluble um, extract and you need that to really pull out you know you can buy some reishi fruiting body chunks and you can put them in some tea and you can get some compounds but really you're only going to get 25 to 40 percent of the compounds out of that uh, out of that mushroom you're not going to get you know through the ethanol extraction and how that's done you can pull a varying amount of extra of triterpenoids and other polysaccharides and beta glucan compounds out of the mushroom and so yeah you really need to have a dual extract um, as a baseline and then it's really how well is it extracted and then there's really that discussion around mycelium and fruiting body and which one's better and i guess you know so sort of mentioning before really it's a matter of you know we believe in working across the whole life cycle of the mushroom because there is value in mycelium absolutely just like when you're looking at a fruiting body if you imagine that as an, an elderly person um, there are compounds there, there are benefits there but it is aged and it is on its way out it's degrading and but it still does have some important compounds but the mycelium is youthful is vigorous is, is very adaptive is fighting uh, to grow and is expressing a lot of medicinal compounds and so the key conversation there is if there's mycelium involved, which there should be in a good product, 
how much starch is involved and that needs to be next to nothing and I guess through our own processes that we have patented we're able to get it down to 0.18% starch so next to no starch it's just pure mycelium which has a great medicinal benefits. There's a lot of I'm glad you brought this up because there's a lot of confusion I think um, in terms of <laughs> fix your air cookie um, <laughs> this weird thing <laughs> my dog looks so cute when her little ears are down but for some reason when like she flips them over and then the pink part shows cuteness goes down by 50% <laughs> thankfully she can't understand English I'm sorry cookie she's our now our permanent co-host pretty much every show I do she comes and sits with the guests yeah. it's quite sweet yeah she's yeah. very peaceful yeah I think it's it's like she's my little oxytocin booster <laughs> but anyway I digress. Going back to the mycelium versus fruiting body, I think there's a lot of consumer confusion and also debate amongst the manufacturers of mushroom products as to whose is the best. There's this, mm. you know, rivalry kind of going on. And in that recent film, Fantastic Fungi, um, Paul Stamets, who's arguably one of the world's foremost experts on all things mushrooms of all types, makes a really strong point and um, indicates there's now a lot of research being done that would support the idea that the mycelium is really where the medicine is concentrated and that's yeah. what you want. Yeah. And then he has a company called Host Defense that um, makes medicinal mushroom products and capsules and whatnot. And, um, and there have been other companies like that too. And I don't want to be disparaging toward his stuff because I haven't, you know, I haven't opened up his bottles in a long time, but mm -hmm. it's one of the ones I've tried. And there seem to be a lot of products that do have a lot of that starch in them. And I think I've been confused about, well, is that starch like the growing medium that just ends up in a capsule? Because when I open it up, it doesn't have a smell. It doesn't really have a taste. Yeah. Am I just eating a bunch of sawdust or rice? fiber and or am i getting the medicine in the mycelium so i find yeah. this to be very confusing yeah i guess like you guys are like it doesn't matter we're just going to extract it all out and you're going to get the the medicinal components or constituents mm. rather that are in the mycelium and the fruiting body you're going to put them in a liquid extract and then you don't have to worry about any of that yeah but do you think i don't you know i don't want you to point fingers and like put other people down because you're a very high vibe guy you're not gonna be like our product's the best don't buy other shit but are there a lot of mushroom products just frankly on the market that suck and are just basically like rice powder and a bunch of sawdust that don't have any of the medicinal constituents left in them? You've got some of that and you definitely have a lot of products that are imported from China that are repackaged and labeled and, and then you don't have a, a, a supply chain transparency or traceability growing in, you know, in China where you know that 45% of farmable land is now not farmable because of the way that they've sort of you know polluted their own environment and so you've got both issues r arising in terms of the quality of the product is there starch in this product it, you know from a, a locally grown product or is it an imported product and you don't know really the efficacy behind it and the potency behind it and it's in a powder form as well which isn't as bioavailable and so you've got sort of both things happening and I'm pretty sure in the CBD space you've got those same debates happening across different things and there's always economic bias as to why people are saying what they're saying and that that occurs you know because maybe they're getting their mushrooms from China so they're going to support the China story or maybe they're growing them here and they want to support that story and so I guess you have to ask those questions around yeah you know, where was it growing how was it growing and just first of all try the product for yourself did you notice anything you know, and I guess with us and, uh, you know, what you were saying before, you know, typically you, maybe you're feeling a, a grainy taste to it. Um, so with our extracts, you know, there's, you're getting more light sweetness because mycelium is actually quite sweet. If you eat pure mycelium, it's actually quite palatable. It's quite nice. You can, you can eat it. It's got a sweet taste to it. Oh, that's interesting. Mm. Yeah. It, with the, the powder extracts, do I have this right? Because there's a, there's a, a couple companies that I really like the powdered extract, like of course Four Sigmatic. Anyone that listens to this show, you hear me talk about it all the time. I use them constantly. Um, they're also more palatable. You know, it's like I don't think if someone had cancer, I wouldn't be like, hey, have one little packet of Four Sigmatic every morning. You know, I'd yeah, be like, yeah. you need to like mega dose on <laughs> reishi, like drink a whole bottle of this, yeah. and you know, five tablespoons of that extract. Yeah. 
so you know it depends on what your your kind of purpose is and where mm-hmm. your health is um there's another company i i love their reishi extract called um longevity power yeah and they make this like i mean it looks like powdered coffee it's like dark dark yeah. almost black really potent powdered extract of yeah. reishi it's quite bitter it's totally unpalatable it would <laughs> never take the place um in a mega dose of something like a four sigmatic which yeah. is you know has all these other herbs and it's quite palatable and mixes well in coffee and whatnot so i use a number of different powdered extracts also real mushrooms mm-hmm. um uh, i interviewed a guy named jeff chilton uh who's an old buddy of Paul Stamets, like an OG mushroom yeah. importer. Their mushrooms come from China, but up in the mountains where yeah. it's not polluted. Cause I kind of asked him about that issue mm-hmm. too, as do, as far as I understand the other two aforementioned brands. So there are some good powders out there. Um, I think the issues with those at times is that they're not that palatable. Like if I take the Rishi powder that I just described and put that in your coffee, you'd be like, ew, this is too bitter. Yeah. I don't care though. Not in a small dose, but in a mega dose. I don't care because I just want the medicine. To me, like everything that I ingest for the most part is for yeah. its effect, not because I want it to be palatable. If mm-hmm. I want palatable, I go out to a farm-to-table restaurant and have a nice meal, right? Yeah. That's not why I'm making a smoothie. I want I want the juice, man. Yeah. So when it comes to um, two, th- two things, I'm trying to make this into a question and not a rant, <laughs> but two things is when it comes to sourcing from China – I'm assuming it depends on where they're coming from, right? I mean, there's it's a massive country, mm-hmm. and there are areas in which there are mushrooms being grown, you know, for medicinal purposes where it is pristine and not polluted. Yeah. Right? I mean... I'm, I, there are places, there are, I guess, forests and things in China right. uh, where you can where you can do this. And I think, if, if you don't want to single out China as a thing, I think as a, as a sustainable method going forward, uh, you know, what's the carbon footprint of our food? And understanding that you know we should be eating locally sourced food for many reasons. For example, honey should be eaten from its local environment because then that way you're getting the antiviral and the antibacterial and the flowers and the you know immune benefits from your local flora and fauna. And so there's benefits to that as well from an energetics point of view and from an antiviral and antibacterial point of view. So I guess from our point of view as a company, we just believe in locally growing product um, and and being as transparent as possible. And if you can do that. And that's a good start in educating the market on um, those key points as to how to, I guess, identify a good quality product. And again, like you said, where you're up to. Powders can be a great entry-level piece, you know, because it's sort of, you know, I'm very new to mushrooms and I want to try some um, extracts and liquid extracts. You know, we find we have, you know, elite athletes and professional surfers and different forms of people using these products from a performance point of view, Dave, because Asprey, because they want that, they want to feel it. Um, immediately or, or quickly um, to know that that's working for them. So I think it is a balance between, yeah, we've been stuck in that model of if it tastes bad, it must be good for us. Um, I don't think is always the case. <laughs> you know, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's been something I've struggled with a lot because then, like, for example, I just got two giant jugs of my Sir Thrival colostrum. Mm. And that's a health product that tastes freaking delicious, and yeah. it's also really good for you. Mm. So if you just tasted that, you'd think, wow, this kind of tastes like vanilla, milky, buttery, delicious, kind of like a powdered creamer, I guess yeah. you could say. You could mix it into a smoothie or elixir or something like that. So something like that, you, you'd you never imagine that it has all these immunomodulating benefits and um, steroidal benefits and, and all of these great medicines in it. It just tastes like a milk powder you know and then there are other things that have horrific taste i remember years ago i used to get these um fresh juices of bitter melon which will almost make you pass out no one makes it anymore because (laughs) it's like no one can handle it but that's on the opposite spectrum where no one except the most psycho person like me is ever going to drink bitter melon extract raw like fresh juice it's just it it literally almost makes you fall down it tastes so Mm. strong and so bad but there's so much medicine in it so i think it is you know a balance of kind of really getting to know the different companies that you're buying your products from Mm. and doing a bit of research and understanding like where they're sourcing. And as you keep mentioning that word transparency Mm. of like, does it say on the bottle where it comes from and the, the, you know, the origins of the supply chain and its impact on the local economy where it's from and the people that are producing it and the employees and everything that goes into it, I think is really, really important. And it's exciting that that's becoming more widespread and, 
a brand like yours is going to build value on the relationship of transparency to the customer where you can go like, here, want pictures of our lab? It's right here. But uh, what I was alluding to before, the second part of my question was, you know, leaving apart the, okay, we've got a good origin source. We know it's clean. It wasn't from a crappy place in China, et cetera. Um, And uh, we were hoping that the strains are valid and all of that. But when it comes to the absorption, this is what I'm curious about. If I'm doing a powdered extract, is that powdered extract made from... Uh, like doing the water and the alcohol extract, making it into a liquid and then spray drying it into some sort of powder medium. Like what do they use? Like maltodextrin or something like that to make it into a powder again. And then you're doing that extract. Would it not be more beneficial? And maybe the answer is yes, which is why you guys are doing it to just keep it as a liquid rather than trying to reconstitute it as a powder. It's always that balance between, I guess, you know, trying to make it as convenient for the customer and so that's why taste is very important, like we've been speaking about, but also to not ad- ad- or, you know, not interfere with that process as much as possible and keep it in its natural form as much as possible. And that includes the compounds as well. And so when you transition them from a liquid to a powder, uh, you know, subjectively we know that you know it's definitely decreasing the potency. Um, and on a scientific level, the bioavailability is decreasing as well. Right. Just like when you grab a tomato, and if you pick that tomato and it's in your backyard, it tastes a lot better than if you get something from the shops because energetically and bioavailable-wise, you know, it's so much fresher. And so this is, the, I guess, the piece with extracts is that bioavailability and also how it's absorbed. It's not going necessarily through your stomach. It's going sublingually straight under your tongue. It's a very common way that people take it. So you're absorbing it quicker. So absorption modalities in, are very important. You know, oral sprays, liquid extracts versus powders, um, they all have different absorption rates. Yes, yes. Okay, that's where I wanted to go because even if you have a high-quality powdered extract, if you're eating it then it's got to go through the whole digestive process and what you really want is for the medicine in that thing you're taking to be in your blood like that's where we're trying to get it right as quickly as possible so if you've got a potent extract and you're doing it sublingually under your tongue then the capillaries in the mucous membrane in your mouth are actually going to uptake that directly without the interference of having to go through your different organ systems in the digestive tract and be subject to the rather hostile environment Mm. in terms of the pH and the acidity in your stomach too, which things like probiotics oftentimes don't survive through. Exactly. And and it's also keeping it alive as much as possible in its active form, which in a liquid in in its ethanol water extract solution, it is more alive. Is there assistance of the alcohol not just as a preservative but as a carrier is is there not like some uh, vasodilation happening when you do a sublingual tincture that has alcohol in it is there better absorption because of that as well versus just something that has glycerin in it or something exactly that's and that's sort of a question we sort of get is oh do you do a glycerin uh, version which glycerin is do get good uptake but that vasodilation you get with the ethanol compounded with the fact that you're getting those triterpenoids and the other compounds um, from that extraction process, um, just make for, you know, I guess a faster absorbing, uh, more noticeable product. I definitely have noticed two things mm. uh, with your guys' stuff is the lion's mane, and we'll, <laughs> we'll talk about the different ways that you can stack lion's mane, but I'll do pretty mega doses of that to test out two things, just cognition, focus, mental acuity in general, and then also improving REM sleep. Uh, both of which have been dramatically improved from doing like a few droppers under the tongue and I hold it there forever and just let it all soak in. Mm. And then also using the cordyceps uh, before working out. And I need all the help I can get when I work out. It's not (laughs) not something I particularly enjoy doing, but I I have built it into a fairly um, regular practice. And I find that I'm definitely more... um, I'm just stronger. Like I have a little more endurance when I do the cordyceps, which is, I know one that's really popular with athletes. So let's break down kind of the different, most common medicinal mushrooms that people use and what they use them for. And I guess we could start with kind of the, in the Chinese medicine world, reishi being, you know, the Mac daddy of them all. The Mac daddy, the the mushroom of immortality, exactly. So that's, uh, I mean, when I was over in China, it's on all the temples. It's in a lot of artwork over there. 
Um, it's very revered for a long time. It was seen as a, as a gift very early on in terms of something that you would give a family member to keep away bad spirits. And that was sort of the Eastern philosophy of it. But then it moved into consuming it in a tea and in extracts. And really what we know is it's an immunomodulator. It's non-specific, And so when people say, what does this mushroom do? You know, does it work on this or this or this? Uh, they're so vast and so broad spectrum in what they can do is they're very you know, smart in, I guess, identifying and at their core, upgrading the immune software. And that immune software of your natural killer cells, your macrophages, your phagocytes, can then, with an upgraded software system, very quickly and early identify any issues within your system and wherever those issues may be. And so the reishi is a subjectively very calming mushroom. Uh, you know, it's very good to take if you're overwhelmed and overstressed, which, you know, maybe LA traffic, maybe everyday life, being a parent, being an entrepreneur, um, being a podcaster, biker, we all deal with stress on a daily basis. And so from a stress point of view, calming that nervous system down, uh, supporting that immune system as well um, to fight any sort of niggles that we may have internally and identify those quickly before they, you know, I guess, cannibalize into something much more serious or sinister. Reishi is a, an amazing mushroom for that. And also, based on my subjective experience, quite difficult to grow on your own. <laughs> <laughs> Not to mention the extraction process. So, you know, still on stage one with you, but that's... <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I I used to go back in the... God, this is going back 20 years, man. I used to go to Chinatown here in L.A., yeah. and they're really fascinating. I always loved going in those herb shops in Chinatown. In San Francisco, even when I was a kid, we used yeah. to go there, but they have these giant... You know, it looks like kind of like a medical lab almost, these giant bottles with huge uh, uh, ginseng roots yeah. that are suspended in some liquid formaldehyde kind of, you know, looking <laughs> thing, like a brain in formaldehyde sort of. And then they have these massive jars and just the overwhelming smell of all these herbs and things like that. And so I used to buy these sliced reishi mushrooms. They kind of look like brown bacon. Mm. And then I remember trying to eat them. <laughs> like, you can't eat them. They're uh, They're like wood, you know? A lot of like very firm cellulose, and so then I would uh, talk to them in a in a what do you call it? De what's the word? Decocked, detoxed, decocked is when you get your penis removed. Um, <laughs> de I would I would boil them uh, and then make this tea, and reishi tea made like that tastes like shit. I mean, it's like it's really bad. really gross. Unlike chaga tea, which is amazing. But uh, reishi is one of those ones that is just ubiquitous in, in the herbal system of Chinese medicine. I mean, it is probably the one you're going to find most commonly. And then when I finally figured out the extracts, um, I do find that one to be really calming and relaxing. It's not one that you would get energy from. It's one that's just sort of like turns down your nervous system exactly so typically you know maybe more an evening thing or an afternoon thing but of course if you wake up overwhelmed or you've got a, something stressful on and you need to feel calm and centered then that can be a good one you know it's sort of turning down the volume whereas cordyceps is turning up the volume so they're they're going in different directions got it okay and then what about um let's talk about cordyceps cordyceps the uh i think with the cordyceps we've saved a lot of marriages um, testimonially you know anecdotally in terms of just that stamina that you get that vitality that you get with uh with the cordyceps mushroom known as the tibetan viagra oh uh, are you serious i didn't know about this part <laughs> i've been wasting it on working out <laughs> jesus <what> a... <laughs> you're definitely getting that level of energy um that you may you know require stamina vitality and it can be a good substitute for caffeine or coffee or if you really sort of want to take off add it to your coffee um, but it's a great piece where you're not getting that peak and trough of energy flow, more a four to six hour buzz or flow um, without sort of that adrenal fatigue attached to it, which we can sometimes be succumbed to with coffee because we can you know, have another coffee after lunch or it's too late in the day and then that interrupts with our sleep. And so it's really, I guess, with that, you know, the uh, the adaptogen you know, of the cordyceps is that it can turn down the volume itself if your environment is turned down. So they're very smart in that sense that, you know, if you have good health hygiene and bed hygiene and sleep hygiene, that you know, the cordyceps won't keep you up at night, which is which is very smart and a great thing. But the most important aspect is that it increases ATP production. So adenine triphosphate helps stimulate mitochondrial, you know, regeneration. Um, and it's amazing at cellular repair as well. So from an anti-aging strategy, um, you know, it helps, I guess, penetrate the... DNA or RNA of an infecting virus or of infecting bacteria and stops it from replicating. And what about the different strains of cordyceps? I know there's been a lot of buzz about the ones that work and don't work and 
as it was made popular, I guess, in the Chinese medicine system, mm. or maybe even in Tibet, was the cordyceps that grow on the back of a worm or something like that. And they're very revered and quite expensive if you want to get that strain of an extract because they have to be hand collected by monks and you know <laughs> up to 20,000 feet up in the in the um Himalayas and whatnot but what's what's kind of the the background on on cordyceps in terms of that strain and the other ones now that are available and yeah. are some of the strains relatively useless as I understand there's it? sinensis and militaris are the two sort of main ones but the, uh, it's fascinating you know we're finding new strains of cordyceps every couple of weeks you know um, it's finding approximately you know 700 new stra- different strains of mushroom a year that have been unidentified, and so there's, we're really only on the iceberg of the fungi kingdom, as we mentioned before. And so with cordyceps, there's sinensis and militaris, are the two well-known mushrooms that are in the mainstream as a product. Both are, are reasonably good and fairly similar in what they do in terms of increase ATP, increase oxygen uptake, increase stamina, increase vitality. Again, it more so goes back to the extraction process and the, the modality in which you're consuming it and how it was growing. Um, so both are, are good to take, but the cordyceps as a base is always growing in its natural environment by, you know, I guess impregnating itself into a host, making it attractive enough to consume by a host and then uh, overtaking the host's body over time to then you know, release its spores popping out of its head or out of its body. And so it's not very vegan friendly in many ways, the cordyceps, when it's grown in its wild environment. When we grow it uh, and many other farms grow it in their sort of, I guess, commercial environment, then we're growing it off of rice or other substrates. Can you grow that one off coffee too? We haven't coffee done grounds? that one off coffee, no. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Cool. So the other, the ones that aren't coming off the head of a dead worm are still good for you. <laughs> They're still good for you. Okay. Yeah. I mean, well, I was in Pennsylvania um, recently with one of the guys from Fantastic Fungi, William, um, and yeah, we went cordyceps foraging, and we were out there for four hours, and we found one little pinprick um, in a in a spot that he sort of knew that uh, has many cordyceps. So wild harvesting, you can understand the value because it's like finding a needle in a haystack. You know, you yeah. could have walked over it in, in two seconds, but we d- dug it out, and it, again, it was attached to a host, uh, to a caterpillar. Oh, really? Mm, yeah. So you did find one yeah, of those. Yeah, Damn. Yeah, 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 I've heard that if you if you want those, I forget what it, you know, it's like $10,000 a kilo or something crazy, like if you are able to source. Scarcity that, has value. Yeah. yeah. Then what about one of my favorites and one that I've been using as a tea, just I go on Amazon and I buy chunks of it and that's chaga because I don't live in an area where there's birch trees that I can go collect my own. But I, I love, um, I love just making a big crock pot of chaga. I'll just buy five pounds of it off eBay and it lasts me a couple of years. I put, you know, a handful of chunks in a crock pot with some spring water, boil it for like two days, kind of like making a bone broth. And then I'll use that really kind of, um, dense, uh, tea as a base for coffee and different elixirs mm-hmm. and just keep it in the refrigerator it lasts forever too and it's one of the mushrooms that actually tastes really good as a water extract Yeah. but I also realize I'm missing the fat soluble uh, qualities of it because I'm not then doing an alcohol extract and I've known some friends that will get the water soluble um, parts of it out boiling it then they'll take those chunks and put it in alcohol and after some time they get the rest of it out Mm. or you can just take you know a product like yours and it's all done for you (laughs) but i love the taste of chaga and i love combining it with other things and um also in chinese medicine it's always the one maybe like second to reishi that's so highly revered Mm. and not only in chinese medicine but in russia too where it's very prevalent and used for anti-cancer protocols and all this so give me the breakdown on yeah on chaga that i'm such a huge fan of well did you i guess when you were having that chaga tea what did you notice from you know a subjective point of view yourself well one thing that's great about making the chaga tea is if you use it as a coffee base it makes your coffee very alkaline and Mm -hmm. not acidic so if you're someone that sort of struggles with you know having heartburn and things like that from having acidic drinks or foods that's Mm -hmm. one thing for sure um so it's just kind of a taste thing and also just knowing the properties that support your immune system and also the melanin content and the vitamin D2. So taking large doses of chaga is like an internal sunscreen, sort of like (laughs) astaxanthin. And I'm not really prone to getting sunburn anyway, but I think between taking astaxanthin and a lot of chaga tea, 
I mean, I can pretty much go out in the sun as long as I want. I don't get burned. Yeah. Unless I'm like on the beach in Rio near the equator, which I learned the hard <laughs> way. Cause I was like, I don't get sunburned, bro. Well, yeah, if you're, if you're really close to the equator at a certain time of year. Come no to Australia, it'll test you as well. It's yeah, pretty right, high in right. Australia. But so, so it was, it was more of that. Like, wow, I wonder if this is true. Let me test it. I'm like, holy shit. I'm very resilient to sun when I'm doing a lot of chaga tea. Yeah. What we notice and what we get a lot of testimonials from is your eyes just really light up and become bright. It's almost like a veil has lift, been lifted off of your eyes and they just, you look in the mirror, you're sort of like, what's just happened? That's sort of, you get that three, four days after having chaga extract. You know, you're really, it's one of those ones, you, again, you see those experience, those noticeable differences really quickly in terms of glow of skin and the, the piercing of your eyes and the veil being lifted off of them, which is um quite phenomenal, but from, a, I guess, a... Uh, medicinal point of view you've got the botulin like you said you've got the melanin so it's sort of an internal um, restoration of the pineal gland as well because we know the, the, ma the melanin is very important for the pineal gland and detoxifying the pineal gland melanin is uh, melatonin is very important for that and so there's definitely an aspect there um, in terms of that and that's sort of also what you're getting with the lion's vein which we will touch on in a minute is attached to that pineal gland and that activation and how we can detoxify that um, through the use of lion's mane and through the use of other mushrooms. But with the chaga mushroom, it's, you know, a full spectrum of antioxidants, you know, one of the highest and most antioxidant properties, foods out there in the world. Again, and going back to the story of it, well, it's growing in negative 30 to 40 degree temperatures, uh, Celsius that is, you know, it's growing on birch trees, which is an amazing tree by itself, you know, birch bark, birch sap, you know, xylitol comes from birch. It's it's an amazing uh, tree which has amazing medicinal compounds on its own. And so you pair that with the mushroom chaga, you pair it with a tough climate, and you pair it with a long period of time of which it grows, then it sort of it makes sense as to why it's so powerful. I guess the main question there is really around the sustainable sourcing and harvesting of this mushroom because, again, um, you know, it only grows two birch trees in every... 10,000 will have chaga attached to it or will grow chaga. So it's wow, extremely really? rare. Wow, I didn't realize that. Yeah, and so I guess that's why we're, we're a bit late coming to the party of the the chaga party uh, in terms of finding those sourcing, those very sustainable uh, partners and foragers um, that we can trust because I'm sure this mushroom is going to become very popular as it already is, um, but it's where did we source it from and is it sustainable or are we going to over-harvest it in five years' time and there's no chaga around. And, of course, attached to climate change, um, heating up of different temperatures uh, makes it hard because we're losing a lot of birch forest. And I've heard something about the need to, if you're going to harvest chaga, leaving aside just environmental impact and the scarcity of the birch trees that have these fungal growths on them, which mm. which if you're listening, if you can imagine kind of like a birch tree has a white sort of bark surface kind of powder coated mm. looking at most, right? And then when there's a chaga on, it looks like a big wart or like a cancerous <laughs> tumor basically, right? Um, but that some say that if you harvest a chaga wart, for lack of a better term, off of a... Um, off of a birch tree if it's not been there 20 years or something that it's it's not that good like the longer they're growing on a tree the more mm. time they have to bioaccumulate the nutrients that we're wanting to get in our body by extracting it do you know anything about how you know like the age of a absolutely chaga? We've, we've been thinking about that ourselves in terms of if you've got aged barrel whiskey you would have aged barrel chaga you know that's 10 years plus, 15 years plus, 20 years plus absolutely will have more compounds and more medicinal benefits than a younger chaga and so with you guys wanting to source things locally and now as we sit here right now, your your Chaga product isn't available. You've got the other ones that we're have been talking about and will continue to. But um is that like the one thing you guys are like, ah, oh, well, they don't we don't have birch trees in Australia, so we're gonna have to get this <laughs> from Russia or North Dakota or wherever the hell they come from? Yeah, we have uh, two so a source in Canada, a source in the US and a forager in Lithuania. Um, they're sort of our three um, foragers that we work uh, closely with. So we try to work direct with these foragers and understand that whole story behind uh, that sustainable harvesting. Uh, but we do have a, a, a facility being, I guess, established at the moment in America, in Wisconsin. And so that's where we're doing all of our production um, going forward. And that's where the chaga gets processed. Australia, yet yeah, much too dry for birch trees. Um, yeah. <laughs> and with the chaga... Obviously, like all the mushrooms, it's important that you do the dual extract because 
like when I just make the tea, I'm missing out on a certain percentage of the medicinal value. It's better than doing nothing, of course. Right. Um, but absolutely, if you really want to go full power into fifth gear, and, and again, like you'll see that piercing of your eyes, you'll see that glow of your skin within three, four days, um, and you'll just feel amazing uh, with the chaga mushroom. And then what about uh, shiitake mushrooms, which you guys have as a medicinal extract? And I've always thought of shiitake mushrooms as just being a culinary mushroom and was unaware that they had value in terms of, you know, in, in kind of the herbal medicine system. Very underrated mushroom, the shiitake mushroom. It's sort of, it's not as sexy as the lion's mane or the cordyceps or the reishi, but, um, you know, definitely a daily staple. Of most see it as a, a multivitamin in terms of your mushroom stack, um, in terms of the lentinin as a compound, in terms of the, the ability to help produce and re- reduce a the elastase so elastase is what you get from uv damage there's you know there's obviously collagen is a big word at the moment and collagen products are very popular the other one when it comes to skin health is the elasticity of your skin and the elastin within the skin which gets broken down by aging gets broken down by photo aging as well and so it minimizes the elastase process and this is really what causes the loss of elasticity in your skin and so a huge part of, of photo aging so you know uv radiation protection shiitake is amazing preventing photo aging it's amazing and for cardiovascular health it's also amazing um, and of course like a lot of other mushrooms has the antimicrobial antibacterial and antiviral properties to it so it's not as sexy as the other ones people are very familiar with it because they see it in a dish but if you can stack that in high concentration um, it's great as an anti-aging protocol that's interesting thinking about it. i didn't i didn't know the um the relevance in terms of skin elasticity and all of that that's a really powerful in terms of like aesthetic beauty that's a really powerful combination then with the chaga Absolutely. because you're getting yeah interesting hmm. and it's the vitamin got the vitamin d2 d3 and d4 so oh it it's does full, as well full spectrum vitamin wow, d that's crazy dude all right it's I'm very gonna get, underrated i'm gonna get on that because i <laughs> if you look at my bottles of the life cycle mushrooms you'll you'll see that the um the one that has the most in it is always the shiitake because I'm like, eh, I don't, I don't really know what it does, so I'm not like the other, like the lion's mane, especially in the cordyceps. I go through in like freaking three days. The other one with the shiitake, just to add on that, is hair, skin, and nails. In terms of the strength of your nails, you'll notice very quickly in terms of how stronger and how faster they will grow. Oh, your weird! Nails, and so you're sort of going into Wolverine mode pretty quickly. <laughs> really? <laughs> so it's must it must have something to do with um collagen synthesis or something huh yeah well to, i mean they're not so much combining or containing amino acids as much as the other mushrooms they're containing amino with an i so i m o n amino acids which are a second metabolite to amino acids or a secondary type of amino acid and so this is where really seeing the magic of those proteins that are in, responsible for hair skin and nails Oh, trip out. Wow, God. I always, just when I think I, I know some shit, I sit down with someone like you and I am I get my mind blown again. I learn more. It's so fascinating. All right, then what about, um, what one didn't we cover? Oh, the turkey tail. Another very underrated mushroom. Um, and I think it's really, you know, it's very, found very commonly in the forest. If you go to the forest and you know what you're looking for, you'll find some turkey tail mushroom and there's different strains and varieties. We source our turkey tail mushroom from the Blue Mountains in Australia, which is a sort of a pristine area again, which is a, a utopian forest and um, amazing mountains there. But this mushroom on the research shows PSK and PSP, two compounds, polysaccharide crescetin, polysaccharide peptide, both amazing compounds. PSP has been shown to improve gut health through you know, being a prebiotic. There was a study done out of Harvard University a couple of years ago just to show that it activates macrophages, activates immune cells, activates good gut bacteria. And so we know that gut-brain access really, really to do with mental health, to do with your levels of anxiety um, and, and your general mood every day is really regulated more by your gut than it is by your brain. And so that's very important. So turkey tail as a, as a prebiotic is, is very strong, very potent. What we've seen in uh, with the PSK, which is the other compound in Japan now, it's just been approved and is used in conjunction with uh, cancer treatment a lot now. So this compound is PSK, polysaccharide crescetin, has uh, great sort of properties to help stimulate the immune system post-chemotherapy. And so there's been a study also done in North America that was a rather large study, $2 million study on breast cancer, and it showed 
when having turkey tail in conjunction with chemo that um, the, you know the patient fared better in terms of their ability to bounce back from uh, and their immune system to re respond and reactivate after the chemo so that was exciting it's new early and novel research but it's definitely on the right track the other thing i guess from i mean from our team you know of 10 lab staff our favorite is really the turkey tail mushroom because it's just that mood stabilizer makes you feel really good and if you have any digestive issues crohn's you know uh, allergies allergens any digestive feeling that's really where we've seen great results really oh yeah. that's interesting Again, that would probably be the the bottle that stays the second most full <laughs> like out, of, out of all of them. Um, but I digestive issues have been historically something that I've been working on quite mm -hmm. a bit. And I don't know that I've cracked the code there. But with the prebiotic effect, is the prebiotic still valid in an extract when there's not the actual, you know, um, like when I think of prebiotic, it's like taking, you know, cornstarch or acacia and whatever powder like mm -hmm. that type of shit that is just non-soluble fiber right that your gut bacteria likes to eat to to feed them mm. being prebiotic as i understand it um is that effect still present when you have a liquid extract well that's what the the research showed with the uh the harvard study in terms of the turkey tail mushroom that psp compound as long as that's present um, is what is the stim gives the stimulatory effect to that good gut bacteria. Oh, cool. Because we do know also, I guess, you know, you've got those debates around, um, you know, are these needing to be refrigerated? Are they not being refrigerated, prebiotics and probiotics, and how are they, how are they sort of being absorbed? And are they getting absorbed by they get to the gut? I guess going back to that conversation, the turkey tail is tackling gut issues, so it's, it's going to the gut, whereas when we're taking these extracts, they're going sublingually. A lot of the time are being absorbed um, and bypassing the, the stomach. Oh, yeah, interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, wow, cool. And then what about, uh, what one haven't we covered? Uh, oh, yeah, lion's mane. The the, the favorite one is definitely a, a favorite one and because I think also, you, again, you're getting very immediate benefits and noticeable benefits. And, and one of the things that first came to us, again, that wasn't really in the literature. Um, and again, this is sort of why we go back to the, the belief on, you know, the mycelium having a lot of potency in it, if extracted well, if grown well, if you know you're removing all the grains from the process you know we're getting a lot of people reporting back on that dreaming in that REM sleep which is not in the literature really anywhere around the lion's mane mushroom and its benefits to do that and so it's a great stack the lion's mane and the and the turkey tail because you're combating REM sleep with gut health so you're getting that gut brain access and you're optimizing that but for the lion's mane we know it's really a a remyelinator of nerve cells a regenerator it's, it's helping with neurogenesis it's slowing down and decreasing neuroinflammation which is something we're all suffering from from an, an early age as we sort of get older um, but if you're you know in a neurological can have a neurological condition um, alzheimer's multiple sclerosis uh, parkinson's these kind of neurological conditions can lion's mane help prevent that in some way that's going to be very interesting research to see come out uh, but from a subjective point of view, this mushroom is very popular for optimizing brain health and just feeling better, just having the veil lifted off of you, having that focus, that clarity, that ability to consolidate memory overnight through the REM sleep. So then the next day, if you're studying, you know, you, you're able to consolidate the work you've been do doing. So it's another sort of funny one where it has dual use. It's dual use in the fact that you can take it in the morning and you can have that uplift in focus memory and mental clarity you can take it in the evening and get that increased REM sleep and so you know it's a, a sort of dual purpose mushroom and I guess from our point of view taking one or two mil in the morning and one or two mil at night um, seems to get amazing results and the testimonials have been amazing and you know we just sort of realized the other day that um, we were in Dave's book Superhumans for life cycle lion's mane and him putting it as an essential hack for sleeping and improving REM sleep so Again, we're just sort of, I guess, the team of scientists have done an amazing job. Tomer, the chief scientist there, has done an amazing job at just trying to produce something that's high quality. With the lion's mane, this is, I think, the one I'm most interested in right now for mm -hmm. a couple of different reasons. One is improving sleep because that's just, <laughs> that's one of my main goals in my whole life. And um, <laughs> sometimes my sleep's great, sometimes not. The past week, yeah. like I was telling you, I'm like, what did I do? I don't know. I Like, everything's fine. I'm not, you know, there's no... Mm -hmm known disturbances or major changes in my life or diet or anything in my sleep has just been shit. So 
Um, I use the aura ring to quantify what works, what doesn't. I'm always trying to fine tune the sleep. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because when I've done a big dose of your lion's mane on its own and not done any other funny business with other sleep, you know, herbs and things like that, then my REM sleep score goes up. Yeah. But if I do the lion's mane and I do uh, CBD, I'll do my own yeah, CBD, yeah. then my REM sleep doesn't improve. Mm-hmm. It's weird. It's for me, in my brain, CBD cancels out the benefits of the REM inducing lion's mane, mm-hmm. as far as I can tell based on yeah. my score. There's other factors of like, you know, I looked at my phone too late or went out to dinner and saw headlights driving home. And I mean, there's so many things you don't really know for sure. Mm-hmm. You'd have to really like do A B testing for a couple of months to really fine tune that. But if I do nothing else and I'm following all my other sleep hygiene, absolutely I'll get longer REM sleep. Yeah. You know, hour and a half, two hours, something like that, which is more than I would normally get. Yeah. Another thing I've noticed just for people listening is I used to do I'm out right now, so I'm not Ben, but my buddy Brian, who's been on the show, has a company called Medicine Box and they make like cannabis oil that has thc that you would get from a dispensary that kind of thing but he's really really high quality super beyond organic and he Mm. infuses other herbs into it and makes these really nice tinctures so i don't take that recreationally but i was messing with that with sleep and i would get way better deep sleep but crappy REM sleep. Mm. So it's interesting, like the cannabis and the cbd stuff is really tricky with sleep it's 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 very delicate at least in my brain so um i'm curious about doing more self testing like no funny business with any other stuff and just like tracking my REM sleep from doing the um yeah the lion's mane another thing i've done which has been working pretty well is there's this peptide called um dsip sleep inducing sleep inducing pep ds sleep sleep d (laughs) i forget the acronym (laughs) anyway dsip yeah, uh, and it's a peptide you inject subcutaneously okay. for deep sleep, and you do it a couple hours before you go to sleep, and my sleep will go from you know maybe an hour to an hour and a half or even two to two and a half hours, so it's, it's a marked improvement. What's interesting about that is that if I do the lion's mane and that peptide, then I get really high scores of both, so mm-hmm. it doesn't have the interference that like a CBD product does, so... Interesting stuff, you know, and I'm sure it's different for every single brain on the planet because we all have a unique biochemistry, but I'm always trying to find the supplements that I can use that bring both of those scores continually higher and then just like stick with what's working. Absolutely, that synergistic benefit and that's sort of a good segue into all of these extracts having kakadu plum in it, which is a sort of a native indigenous bush fruit in Australia, quite rare, uh, which grows up in Arnhem Land and sort of similar to chaga in terms of it growing in a very tough climate. Um, over a period of time, um, these trees that establish themselves in you know very remote desert-like parts of uh, of Arnhem Land in northern Australia, but this is a the highest understood fruit with kakadu plum in terms of vitamin C in the world, and so that potency of that vitamin C, and again taking it in its whole body form, not in its supplement form, and and finding you know that getting it in an isolate vitamin C powder is very different to finding it in a full spectrum. Uh, fruit and extracting it that way and so we find that was sort of when we were sort of doing our R&D and understanding what synergistic benefits we could find to go with these mushrooms and complement them the uh, vitamin C definitely helps amplify the aspect of the mushroom and, and high dosing vitamin C is very important as well as a, as a strategic tool with that uh, what's it called kakadu kakadu plum kakadu yeah. plum kakadu plum uh, weren't you telling me that it the comparison of the amount of vitamin C it has compared to an orange or camu camu, isn't it like ridiculously it's, high? In it's ridiculous. C? It's sort of like around 90 to 100 times an orange in terms of a serve. <laughs> Holy shit. And so it's, um, again, just when you can put that in an extract form, this is the, the beauty of, you know, again, like going back to, yeah, you, you, when you had fresh mushrooms that you were growing in a town and a city, then you weren't able to scale those. But now we're able to, I guess, share that kakadu plum with Australia, with other countries in terms of getting you know a small serving size but getting a, a huge impact from that so it makes it super easy and simple but yeah the kakadu plum is a, is a fascinating mushroom yeah, i've never heard of it fruit. prior prior to you guys yeah i wonder if that has anything to do with the 
the shiitake skin benefits because vitamin C is a catalyst for collagen synthesis, which makes your skin, hair, nails, etc. I wonder if there's any correlation there. I think there is because uh, you know, we've got very close connections uh, to community and so we're very lucky to be able to source vitamin C through the kakadu plum. Um, but kakadu plum is becoming extremely popular uh, with skincare. Oh, it is. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely booming. And and funny enough, I think if you look at skincare, if you look at Korean as as a leader in that space, um, just through investment and how much it's a priority to them, um, shiitake mushroom you'll see in a lot of ingredients in shiitake skincare, and um, oh, top and topical stuff too. Yep, oh, yep, interesting. Yeah. So not just ingesting it. No, exactly. So the shiitake is very popular there, and the kakadu plum is becoming very popular there as well. Okay, going back to lion's mane. Yeah. So. There's the REM sleep part of it. Then there's the thing that's become now quite, you know, famous thanks to Paul. St- is it Stamets or Stamets? Stamets going on uh, Joe Rogan a mm, couple times. Yeah. You know, and that show just gets so many eyes and ears yeah. on it. And talking about the famous Paul Stamets stack, which is the microdosing mm. of psychedelic mushrooms. Uh, you know, uh, 100 milligrams to 200 milligrams, and not not a discernible psychoactive effect where you're tripping on mushrooms, yeah. but more of a nootropic thing. And then he figured out the, the certain amount of niacin and also adding lion's mane to that stack um, adds to the the potency and the general effect for brain health and just you know making you alert and creative and all that. And that's a stack that I personally love. I do it uh, probably three days a week, four days a week, take a couple of days off. I don't mm. There's like a very specific schedule you're supposed to follow with it, which I always forget. So I just do it <laughs> randomly and make sure yeah. I don't do it every day because you build up a tolerance to the psilocybin and then it's pointless. Uh, but do you know anything about the relationship between the psychedelic mushrooms in a microdose and the lion's mane? Because I found that um, taking the f- particular formula that I was able to procure from an unnamed source, mm. uh, which is this amazing tincture that has all these medicinal mushrooms and niacin and the psilocybin. But I'll do that, and then I'll take like a mega, mega doses of your lion's mane, and I'm on fire, man. <laughs> like my brain is just I'm so alert and um, in such a great mood and just extremely focused and creative my brain just loves that combo. So what do you know about the psychedelic end of mushrooms as it pertains to mixing it with lion's mane? Yeah, I mean, they're both, and as Paul mentioned on that show with Joe Rogan, like the closest thing you can get to that psychedelic mushroom or microdosing is the lion's mane. And so if you compound them together, they both act, they both activate, you know, those nervous system and neurogenesis within the brain and unlock the doors, allowing each part of the brain to talk to each other. And so on, I guess, a, a level right now, lion's mane does that on its own. Um, psilocybin, the compound within the magic mushroom, does that as well to, for a more profound effect. And so, you know, you combine those together, you combine those together with the niacin, which is sort of the ability to get into those deep, uh, finer, more intricate nerve endings, allows for a, a deeper connection. And so those three are sort of, as Paul talks about, is, um, you know, allowing that focus and you're seeing that as well with the the lion's mane and the and the psilocybin and so well why is that occurring because of that effect of unlocking different parts of your brain allowing them to talk to each other and so you're on fire because you're activating more of your brain rather than running dormant at 15 to 25 percent of our capacity which is pretty much what we're doing most days interesting yeah i'm a big fan and i'm looking forward to more research and more product development Mm. in this area because i think that it just I don't know, can help so many people who have become dim-witted due to the the tainted food supply and the water supply and pollution and EMFs and all these things that are fighting against us and the inoculations we get when we're babies and just the human body and specifically the brain is just completely getting its ass kicked by the time you're a 49 year old <laughs> guy like me and then self-induced brain abuse too <laughs> through partying and whatnot. Yeah. I use the term partying loosely at a certain point for many of us, it's not a party anymore, but a necessity that's also very self-destructive. But <laughs> point being is our brains are really getting hammered so badly. So I'm looking mm-hmm. forward to more developments in the mushroom world, whether they be psychedelic lion's mane and combinations and new sort of formulae that can help upgrade the brain. And also something that doesn't have a lag effect or, you know, you're stealing from tomorrow to pay for today in terms of so a lot of nootropics or other, you know, pharmacological um, products out there that may be doing that. 
and so we need to be finding you know natural solutions that aren't doing that and that have a you know longevity to them which in many ways we don't necessarily know until we go down that journey because you don't know what you're going to find out but i guess going back to what makes sense in terms of these mushrooms in terms of lion's mane mushroom as well we know that it's having an amazing benefit now and it's available now and it's something that you know personally i believe everyone over 50 over 45 should be on lion's mane i think actually everyone should be on lion's mane as a, as a base um and on across a lot of these mushrooms. i mean imagine just like for kids too dude like when a when a kid's brain is developing you know and that neurogenesis uh, meaning the 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 birthing of new neurons in the brain is happening on its own imagine you know i'm not <laughs> recommending as a parent that you do this like check with your health <laughs> provider you know i don't know i'm just speculating you're a completely armchair yeah uh, scientist but not the psychedelic mushrooms i would say but with the lion's mane imagine when like a kid's brain is malleable and growing and taking in new information and they're walking around in this beautiful theta state of creativity and imagination if you're assisting that with something like lion's mane it could be really profound absolutely and this is sort of a conversation around evolution and how do we optimize health and this is what you're the you know the master of in terms of biohacking how do we do that and how do we how do we zoom out to go hang on what's happened over the last one hundred thousand years ten thousand years and and in which direction are we heading in well i think that's what's so fascinating in that fantastic fungi film is the hypothesis of the the what's you know for what they call it the psychedelic ape or whatever right that yeah that stoned ape hypothesis yeah the stone that's what it is that's the stoned it. ape hypothesis you know um terence and dennis mckenna and this whole thing i've, I've friend, you know yeah. who, who knows if that's actually true we i don't know if there's you know conclusive evidence to support that mm. per se but i know um not so much on the on the lion's main tip but I was talking to someone last night just around the very first time that I very unintentionally took LSD, which is just, I think, on my 17th birthday, and just I just wanted to get fucked up, you yeah. know? I took a hit of acid in home ec class, which is probably not the ideal <laughs> set and setting, uh, or it came on in home ec, you know? So here's how you put the Tupperware in your kitchen, and it's all kind of <laughs> melting in my hands. But uh, then, you know, went to a party afterward, and I remember just standing on the porch, this is in Colorado, and... I was also drinking and, you know, being yeah. a, just a dumbass teenager also. But I remember looking up at the sky and I just went, oh, my God, I'm so insignificant. And it was just the most hilarious thing I'd ever, you know, the realization of just like how meaningless my dumb little problems and micro dramas and all of these things were and how I was just beyond smaller than a grain of sand in the in the great scheme of things and then you know whatever passed out came to and have never been the same just from that one moment yeah you know and i think that's something that's so interesting about the world of psychedelics and specifically as they pertain to mushrooms mm. and that was not even trying you know that was an accidental awakening that stuck with me forever and didn't necessarily at that point change the trajectory of my life but it definitely changed my orientation to reality moving forward and there was no putting the genie back in the bottle in terms of how I perceive reality. And some years later, I did in fact have, which I didn't realize at the time, but quite a profound spiritual experience by taking copious amounts of mushrooms. Again, just trying to party and have fun and had kind of a, oh shit, <laughs> yeah. I need to change my life moment, you know? And so I think um, the way that these, this kingdom interacts with our brain is really fascinating and I'm excited about what research and development has to offer. That said, are you guys poised at all in terms of your R&D into moving into the psychedelic mushroom space as, uh, you know, things become, the legality of it becomes more loose as we're seeing now in, you know, Oakland and Denver and different mm -hmm. places. There's churches or uh, clinical applications of using psilocybin that are becoming more acceptable. Everyone sort of, yes, awakening to the mushroom church which is sort of this Im impending, uh, you know, legalization that will take place at some point. But for us, you know, from a, a company point of view, we uh, have that vertical integration. We understand intimately how to grow mushrooms, how to extract to the highest quality. And so uh, it definitely makes sense to be involved in that space at some point. We have conversations at the moment with universities and colleges in both Europe and in the U.S. at the moment. So they're ongoing. And so looking at that research and it's just a, such a wide range of applications you know, in terms of PTSD, in terms of depression, in terms of mental health, in terms of human optimization, in terms of so many areas, in terms of healing, in terms of perspective and insight. Um, it's very exciting for humanity as a whole. 
the whole area um, and as it develops and I guess it sort of got shut down in the 60s and 70s and we sort of, you know, I think in some ways put our own evol- evolution on pause um, from doing that. But again, we need to make sure we're doing it in the right set and setting and the right environment and how that's done. Because as you mentioned, you know, you sort of just had a, a random trip, but it changed your perspective. And so what happens if it's used intentionally and medicinally in the right way, in the right setting, then what can we gain from that? Yeah, in that film, they're showing uh, psychiatrists using, you know, psilocybin journeys as a means by which to help people with depression and PTSD mm-hmm. and things like this. And it was so interesting to watch that because they they lay back on the, you know, kind of the classical psychiatrist couch, put on an eye mask, and they're, you know, kind of holding the, their hand and guiding them through and waiting yeah. for the dose to kick in. And I'm like, God... Aside from ayahuasca, I've never done a psychedelic with that much attention or a guide and sort of a caring, safe environment mm-hmm. like that. And I thought, wow, that would be so interesting. I've not taken like recreational psychedelics at yeah. all in a long, yeah. long time. Yeah. But I thought, wow, there, it would be really interesting to do a nice hero's dose of psilocybin intentionally at some point in nature and in the right setting, whether it be ceremonial or get led by a guide of some sorts. You know, mm. I bet there's so much insight and healing uh, potential there to be explored. I think so. And I mean, it's just sort of those fundamental reports that you hear around ego dissolution, perspective and insight. And I think, you know, ego dissolution is a very important one at the moment for humanity and where we're up to and the the capitalistic nature in which we are uh, signed up to and very much, you know, we're, we're always reporting on GDP. We're reporting on numbers that really don't matter so much in the scheme of things now. So we need to change those metrics. So we need to change our point of view and our perspective. And and how can we do that? Then maybe those psychedelics can play a role in that. I, I think so. And I think uh, the sacred use in which they've been used for thousands of years, it's very important that that's, I guess, honoured and respected and not these things treated as a necessarily always a party drug to be taken um you know at coachella or at burning man or <laughs> they have those elements to them but um yeah. we're not really getting the full potential out of them yeah absolutely uh you know i left out the 50 other times i did psychedelics and <laughs> got nothing out of it except maybe a good time followed by you know a harsh come down in the parking lot of a grateful dead show or something <laughs> um but moving into culturally and economically speaking, um, and kind of, I guess, we'll segue out of the medicinal benefits Mm -hmm. of mushrooms. And I'm also very interested in something that you guys seem to be um, going into um, and pioneering would be ecological and environmental uses of mushrooms. So let's talk about um, some of those things, ways to mitigate pollution, clean up oil spills, uh, alternatives for plastic, things like this. Like, give me where you think this is going, where we are right now, what what are some of the potentials as your long-term vision? Yeah, I guess we've sort of just you know, whiteboarded what are, what are the big issues and not being too biased on mushrooms, where can mushrooms play a role and, you know, being you know wrapped up in the world of mushrooms and a kingdom it's like well they can solve so many things and so what are high on the priority list and one that's not necessarily spoken about a lot uh is antimicrobial resistance and resistance to antibiotics and the breeding of superbugs being an enormous issue for you know i guess a threat to, to humanity in terms of you know getting viral infections and bacterial infections that spread and not able to be uh stopped almost like a wildfire and we already know that over the next 10 years, the expectation of how many people will die from antimicrobial resistance, which is resistance to antibiotics, which is a life-saving drug uh, and is very essential for end-stage disease and and cases where it's required, not being able to be effective anymore because of the micro amounts that we're exposed to with antibiotics, which is coming through our honey, through fish, through chicken, through animal agriculture, but also through plants as well. There's a lot of antibiotics used in you know, plant uh, crops and things like that. So our, again, our exposure to other toxins also now includes any micro levels of antibiotics. And so what we've been working on for the last three years, really across bees, across fish, across another, a number of other animals, is working intimately with farmers, commercial operations, to replace the need for antibiotics or minimize the need for antibiotics because, again, what sort of point do they serve they serve as sort of a an end point of how do we just control this disease it's not a preventative point of view so with that one product that we have called bee immunity which is for bees uh, we've been working with hives across australia we did a 
trial in Quebec, Canada, where we were able to show that by using our mushroom and bush food extract, so bush foods are the, the kakadu plum and other native ingredients, we were able to show an increase in bee lifespan by 8.22%. And for a healthy beehive, bee population is very important. Colony health is very important because bees all play a very different role. They're all very much committed to the the health of the hive and they work very harmoniously and as a community and so if you have a low population that really build lowers the resilience to hives but also other than that bees are getting you know destroyed by monoculture cropping by pesticide use and by disease and so bees are up against it we know bees are very important and a lot of the time you know beekeepers are you know what do they have in their toolbox to use the only real thing they have at the moment is antibiotics and so We've seen great results there. We've seen great results in other animal uh, industries, and so that's exciting. And again, we only re- learned recently the amount of antibiotics used uh, in plants and crops there as well. So that's one of our key pillars of our of our business as a division is solving that one, and and we're getting great results there. The bee thing is huge because I I think more and more people are becoming aware of this, and I covered it in an episode I did. I uh, don't have the number in front of me, but we'll put it in the show notes uh, with Carly Stein. The CEO of Beekeepers Natural is one of my, mm. well, not one of, my absolute favorite bee product company yeah. and a show sponsor I unabashedly promote all the time because oh, I, I have like product. five jars yeah. of it in my kitchen. I eat it just about every day. It's I just kind got of my some nighttime shots the other snack. Day, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like my nighttime snack. Like a, a <laughs> teaspoon of that honey really helps with my sleep. Yeah. Uh, and then I do the propolis spray like yeah. right when I wake up and I never get cold. It's amazing. But anyway, um, talking to her and learning bit, a, a bit more about bees, and there was a documentary, I think, called The Vanishing of the Bees, if I'm not mistaken. And I, I think many people don't realize like how much the human race is dependent upon bees. Like In other words, if bees just all drop dead today, we're gone. Yeah. Like Our food supply is just gone, period. Yeah. We're, yeah. we're over. Um, and I'm not someone that is necessarily into activism, and I think if human beings are meant to expire and not be on the planet anymore if that's god's will then let's go like the dinosaurs did fine yeah but i don't want it to be at our hands if possible exactly we have a choice we have yeah if there's a meteor and like humans are meant to be gone okay fine you know i'm sure there's many other planets with humanoids on them in the (laughs) you know ever expanding infinite universe but uh but the bee thing is really a concern Mm. uh because of their integral role in pollination of our food supply right and so now we have you know, 5G, we have glyphosate in the food supply. There's so many things that are like working against the bees. So yeah. I think that's a really cool thing that you guys are kind of catching on to is going at the root of the food supply, which is the bees. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and it's funny how sort of things pan out in terms of, well, you know, a lot of bees, at, especially in North America as well, you know, the hives are getting shipped to almond farms for almond pollination because beekeepers get a better price for almond pollination than they do for their honey. But when they go to these almond crops, they're very heavily sprayed, and so you're losing a lot of bees uh, in that in that pace. So it's sort of a, a very complicated cycle, and it's just, you know, where can we impregnate mushrooms and mycelium and, and this as a, a hopeful substitute or resilience builder to their immune system which we've been able to show um, that they that can happen so that's an amazing area but across the animal agriculture there is a, you know widespread use of antibiotics and so it's something again going back to transparency with mushroom products it's the same with our you know fruit and veg it's the same with our uh, meat chicken fish honey whatever uh, people decide to eat we need more transparency there because in that way uh, we're able to trust and we're able to know that we're we're not slowly killing ourselves um, through uh, having these short-term wins by you know overusing antibiotics and then causing superbugs, which then make antibiotics not available to be used. Terrifying zombie apocalypse <laughs> shit. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just gnarly. It <laughs> That's gnarly. The one saving grace I think we have with that is ozone. Mm-hmm. You know, ozone trumps any. It kills all bacteria, fungus, etc. But it's also there's not a lot of profit in the use of ozone so it's not something that's widely used at least in the united states um, medically but that's always the thing i think about when it comes to the you know antibiotic resistance it's like well nothing's resistant to ozone like Mm -hmm. it kills everything so um i love to use that but anyway uh what about the future of like we we see so much in the hemp industry where there's potentials or you can make a car out of hemp and Mm. you know replace plastics and aluminum and things that are going to eventually end up back in our 
ecosystem as pollution and landfills. What are some of the things being made from mushrooms now or that you see potentially could be made in terms of just the utilitarian use of this uh, substance? Yeah, I mean, one great company, uh, I think, out of uh, New York, Ecovative, doing mushroom building blocks, mushroom uh, insulation in for household insulation um, and other aspects of replacing things like styrofoam which don't break down for hundreds of years which you know a lot of food is, is transported in styrofoam boxes all around the place to supermarkets uh, and to grocery stores from farmers and from wholesalers and, and things like that and so replacing styrofoam, replacing any of those uh, fossil fuel based production you know uh, ingredients which then become very hard to break down over a long period of time mushrooms again can be a simple solution and I say simple very hesitantly because there's a lot of R&D required there and there's again going back to what you mentioned about the profit the economics of it have to work out for people to want to make the change um, and that's why it's important to sort of again going back to activism as well it's you know being an activist every day with how you spend your dollars and what questions you ask the companies that you buy from and being aligned to those companies. Oh, so then I, I guess by that metric, I am an activist. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I really do my best to not support companies that don't do it right. Yeah, there almost needs to know. be a top 100 list of, you know, and it needs to be a very thorough um, right. audit process. And they do have some of those processes in place already. But I think, again, that's where sort of things are heading. So mushroom building blocks, mushroom uh, biomaterials is what they're called and bioengineering uh, we you know were contacted by Ralph Lauren recently about that because of being a, a biotech company and we've been playing around with mushroom leather as well we just sort of haven't gone deeply into it because it's a it's a big journey and a long journey um, but that's something that fashion labels want now they want to be able to source that unfortunately they're not able to right now so if anyone's out there interested in that space um, they should be innovating and there's a startup idea but that's interesting um, I mean, I guess it's it's just like if you th if you think about um, these tree mushrooms specifically, if you look at something like reishi or chaga, I mean, it's it's like wood or plastic or you know even a soft brick almost. So you imagine like if if that could be bred and molded and somehow extracted and make that malleable, it's it doesn't seem like that far of a stretch to make something like an insulation or a brick or a car tire or, or anything. Cause it's almost even just naturally, <laughs> it's kind of almost there. I mean, if you, if you go to the uh, Chinatown and buy a big reishi mushroom, I mean, you're like, you could make something out of this just as it is, you know, you could yeah. carve it, sand it and make something useful. Yeah. One of the, uh, the things we're also working on at the moment yet to be released is a mushroom burger. Um, and so, We've been, you know, again, thinking of things in the world, again, the, the amount of energy and inputs put into feeding ourselves, um, it's around finding solutions for that as well. And so we understand that, you know, that meat space is, uh, I guess, you know, very uh, unsustainable for the planet. And at the same time, laboratory-based meats and using soy and using all these other ingredients um, are also very questionable and also <laughs> you think? Uh, a long way away from biohacking. And right. so we're sort of just going sideways. We're not going forward. Um, but we do have a, a mushroom burger coming out early next year, which is a, a patented burger, which has four ingredients, USD organic, and we grow it in 11 days. Holy crap. Yeah. So it, this it's, is uh, exciting, very exciting because I think on, you know, coming from the early days when I was a vegetarian, I did so because the only available meat at the time that was at least I was aware of was like factory farm meat. And I wasn't going to be part of that for a number of different reasons, just in terms of cruelty and the environment and the impact of uh, a negative impact on your health. But now we have kind of a blanket um, environmentalist point of view that says like all animal food production is bad for everyone and the planet. Mm. Many people ignoring the fact that regenerative agriculture, including plants and animals, can actually restore the planet and sequester CO2 and all of this. And then, as you said, there's meat substitutes now that are even worse for you probably than like factory farm meat. Very you know? inflammatory, a lot of numbers. Yeah. And, and how, are that, how is that being even produced? You know, we're knocking down forests to produce more soy. Right. So <laughs> it's, a, you know, it's a complex issue it and is one complex. that won't be solved in the mm. last 10 minutes of the Lifestylist podcast mm. episode with you. But I think that's really exciting um, as people move forward into understanding the, um, 
the positive impact of regenerative farming and learning ways that we can scale that for mass food production and not just for spoiled people like me that get to go to the farmer's market and participate in that, but also in finding um, ways to produce food like you're talking about that is actually good for you, fast and economically viable, viable and scalable. Mm. So if you make a mushroom burger that doesn't taste like mushrooms, <laughs> that that tastes make a mushroom burger that tastes like bacon, I'm in. I'll well, eat it every day. Let's send you one. I think you're gonna like it. It's yeah? not overly shroomy. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. You and wouldn't then, know that it's a mushroom ingredient. Oh, good. Because yeah. there are like the like mushroom burgers that are the alternative to a, a meat patty, and I find those to be yeah. It's usually just a big portobello or something, or a big field mushroom, and it's um challenging, <laughs> challenging. Uh, yeah. And then what about the possibilities of environmental cleanup with mushrooms. I know there's a couple of great TED Talks about this kind of thing where you can use uh, mushrooms to clean up oil spills and pesticides runoff that are ending up in the ocean and all kinds of stuff. What do you know about that and where do you see the future of that application? Going? Yeah, which is a great topic just talking about pesticide runoff. Uh, we know the Mississippi River is just covered in glyphosate, you know, and uh, a lot of these main arteries and main waterways in each of our countries is really washed away and filled with uh, a lot of glyphosate and a lot of pesticides so it's a it's a bit of a disaster there and so mushrooms again at their core are amazing at breaking down uh, compounds both what we would perceive as harmful like hydrocarbons and using them as a food source and so they're able to digest them and they're very intelligent in terms of adapting and creating new food sources for themselves as they're just natural recyclers and so for that reason, that's why they can be implemented in terms of breaking down oil spills in or decontamin or contaminated soil or contaminated waterways. In terms of the work that's been done there right now, there hasn't been you know, really a lot of traction in that space. And that tr probably comes back to uh, you know, the business model of it, you know, who's investing in it and why. And, and maybe uh, that piece in the science is slow, but the early signs of the science as to what we've seen um, from the research, from you know a number of different trials, is that it does work. Does it have commercial application at scale? Not yet. If it gets investment and we get the right people working on it, then it definitely has merit and it definitely is actually a very important piece of work that needs to be done because, as I said, the, the Mississippi River, all of these waterways are being polluted and it's just having such an ongoing effect even to that glyphosate and other pesticides heading out to the, to the oceans as well. And so, um, yeah, it's a very important area and mushrooms again without sounding too biased can play a key role in that um, that system because it can break it down and we know a lot of oil spills from old mining sites or from um, you know oil and gas rigs off the coast um, that are having leakages even in marina bays where we're getting a lot of you know leakages from from boats and things um, you know, just that oil contamination that's rad so trippy because you think about how mushrooms in nature in the like in the forest are such an integral part of the life and death cycle right mm -hmm. so you have tree dies for whatever reason mushrooms eat it turn it back into soil i mean i'm like giving a very simplified version yeah yeah not... i'm sure much more complex but that soil again gets germinated becomes a tree again and it just keeps going around and around and without the mushroom as one of the inputs there that stops it's really the conduit of death and life. <laughs> it's trippy, right? And thinking, yeah. just thinking about that. Okay, so if we know it has the ability to do that, how many ways in which that power can be harnessed for good? It's just super cool. It's so exciting. Yeah, and it's just again a more uncharted territory. It's a, it's an entire kingdom that's been left alone for a long time, and it's a lifetime's worth of work plus four more. You know, there's so many mushrooms yeah. out there. There's so many varieties that we don't even know what they do yet. And they're so mysterious too in 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 the wild because they they stay hidden, mm. you know. They're just they're like little aliens. Mushrooms are just trippy, in the way that they don't show themselves, you know. And I think maybe that's why they've been largely ignored mm. until very recently by people. The one thing that's funny that you get a lot of uh, conversations on is once you start to come into this world of mushrooms, you start to see them everywhere. I'm not sure if that's part of the alien effect or what, but it's <laughs> <laughs> right. But you just start to notice them because you notice where they put where, on rotting logs, um, you know, by nearby creeks where it's humid, where there's good, you know, I guess airflow and and rotting logs again in that humid environment. So, I think going forward, you're going to see a lot more mushrooms in your own life just creeping in. For the home cultivator, mm. uh, I understand you guys 
probably by the time this will have come out, are producing home cultivation kits where someone can actually grow their own? Do we have a, a USDA organic lion's mane grow kit um, that will be available and an oyster grow kit, oyster mushroom grow kit available in the US, which is exciting, and we do that also in Australia. Um, but again, the lion's mane, making it easily accessible and, and connecting people to nature is a part of biohacking. You know, rewilding, renaturing. And so what does that mean if you're living in an apartment in a city? Well, grow some food on your balcony, grow some food on your bench top, and one of those amazing things to grow is the mushrooms. And to see that life cycle of how they grow and how quickly they grow, again is there's that reconnection to um to something real and alive in a in a, a world where it's you know, a lot of things are energetically quite low within cities. Um, how do we bring life to cities and in a very, very simple way? These mushrooms that were grown off of coffee waste and are delicious to taste, you can grow on your kitchen bench in 14 days, and it's a very fun experience. Awesome, man. I love it. I'm going to give it a try. Maybe we'll send I'll, you one. I'll fare better than my the uh, Rishi spore plugs that I tried a few years if ago. If you can't grow this lion's mane, then <laughs> put the shovel down. There's no hope. All right. Cool. <laughs> I'll give that a shot. Um, in closing, who have been three teachers or teachings that have influenced your work and your life that our audience might be able to go learn from? Mm. Um. I'm very big on mentors. It's very def- definitely on, on micro and macro levels. You know, mentors that you've never met that you've seen from afar and admired, and micro as well. And from a micro level, I think you know, very lucky with my parents just being very unconditionally loving and and letting me be free to do whatever I wish to do, which has um, been amazing because I don't think necessarily people always have that support. Um, a chair, our chairman at Life Cycle and at our mycelium. Uh, biotechnology company William Scott. Um, he's been a, a businessman that also has a spiritual, deep aspect side to him as well. So he can play in both fields. Because what you find, I guess, when you're going into the, this business realm, it's all very black and white, profit loss, um, capital markets, etc., which is all very necessary and interesting. But if you can balance that with understanding the bigger picture of uh, the life cycle of how things work, of you know spirituality and and what that means. Um, then you blend those two together. He's been an amazing mentor. Um, but I guess from a beyond that, from an everyday personal point of view, Marcus Aurelius and Meditations is probably my what I would say is my Bible book um, in terms of Stoicism and in terms of just giving you perspective on death and life, on impermanence and what matters. Um, that's been a, a, a good staple where you can just read a couple of pages every couple of days just to uh, reground uh, not get lost amongst the noise and the chaos. So that's probably my my go to is that is that book. Um, and beyond that, there's just been so many people from afar that you you see going through that their journey, going on their own mission and and achieving in whatever way that means. And that's been inspiring as well. And you can name a list of people from you know your Richard Bransons and your Elon Musk's and you know the guys at Brian Chesky at Airbnb and. All of those guys have done in very interesting and, and great work within their field and you find that on an everyday level with people that you meet down the street who own a, a cafe store and they all have an amazing story and journey and there's so much motivation to get from all of them. But I think also, uh, yeah, it's just sort of learning from everyone. Awesome, dude. <laughs> well, I've learned tons from you today. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, it's been real and also real funny in the last few <laughs> minutes because those listening you won't know this because it would have been edited out but uh, cookie my co-host had a barking spell and so we shut it down and went and got the mail which is one of the things she was barking at in addition to the live spring water shout out delivery mm-hmm. which i'm grateful for but uh, i got some some of the blue canatine trochees <laughs> <laughs> and these are kind of like a just were a demo run you know and um so I gave one to our guest Julian and myself, and uh, and I'm watching your whole mouth turn blue <laughs> because these ones dissolve. They're a little different than the real ones that are go- coming to market. These ones apparently dissolve much faster because within five minutes your whole mouth was blue. So it's going to be a funny thing for the people on video to watch. <laughs> like what what just what just happened what to this guy? His teeth are bright blue. So I've been sitting here trying not to crack up, and I've had a really great time talking to you. Awesome. Even right. apart from that. So thanks so much for coming over today. Thank you for making a freaking amazing product. Just when I think I've discovered everything, I discover something really cool. And I love what you guys are doing. And I'm so happy to support your mission. And also, not just like the supplemental end of it, but the things that are to come. I think you guys are coming at it from a really innovative, 
far reaching forward thinking point of view which is very cool awesome so thanks for Love being you an work. awesome awesome entrepreneur dude that's doing things right thanks for giving us the, the biotech biohacking knowledge that we need <laughs> absolutely i'll see you soon see you bye